So this evening, I'm going to discuss some of the key elements and aspects of my liminal worlds research. Um, the overall project consists of four worlds in which I spend most of my time wandering and pondering. Uh, dialects of the hum, future ghosts, we are all ghosts in the making, underpasses are liminal places, and paranoid architecture, Balladian concepts within Neolithic contexts. <clears throat> um, now, at first glance, these may all seem highly disconnected subjects, but hopefully, after this wee talk, um, you'll see that they are all, in fact, rather beautifully connected. I'll be beginning tonight's talk by giving you a little bit of background as to how and why I'm drawn to these particular locations and zones. I'll then discuss each project in more detail. Um, I am going to be putting a lot of information out there over the next sort of 45 to 60 minutes. So please don't worry if you miss anything. Um, I'm more than happy to field questions afterwards. And I'm also going to be approaching these four worlds um, in an, an abridged format tonight. However, um, you will be able to access all of my project articles in full once the website goes live, um, which I think is next weekend. <laughs> so sit back, uh, make yourselves comfortable and uh, let's dive in and hopefully the PowerPoint doesn't go kaput. So, where to begin? I guess it all really kicked off for me in early childhood. Um, I had a bit of a difficult upbringing and I was bullied very badly at school um, and also at home uh, by a parent who subsequently left. Um, I would head to places, both physical and metaphysical, in order to escape. I was later diagnosed with inattentive ADHD and perhaps more importantly, in relation to this talk, synesthesia, um, a neurological condition that manifests in different ways for different people. My condition primarily presents as something called tactile emotional synesthesia. Um, I experience often violently emotional reactions, both positive and negative to certain physical textures. The neurological team and I have subsequently discovered that concrete and stone, funnily enough, are two of my positive textures. Now, it's, it's very difficult to explain how these emotions physically and psychologically manifest within me. In fact, just, just focusing my mind on concrete and stone directly affects me. Um, in fact, even whilst I'm discussing this with you now, um, I, can, I can literally feel my internal organs and my skin starting to warm up. Uh, and very strong, blissful feelings are beginning to emanate. And it does literally feel like my heart is going to burst out of my chest with joy. And uh, when I can actually physically touch these materials, it literally does bring tears to my eyes. My secondary synesthesia is referred to as sound colour. Very basically, this means that certain sounds and vibrations present to me as colours and shapes manifesting before my eyes. Music is one of these elements, um, but so too is the hum. The hum, I conject personally, manifests not just as a human-made electrical source, transmitted through pylons, power stations and techware, but also as a natural phenomenon um, which pulsates through wood, 
water, stone, soil, and space. Through my sound color synesthesia, I can literally see these vibrations, pulses, radiating from their conveyors. Although the visual manifests primarily from the hum that's being emitted from electrical structures, pylons and so forth, I have thankfully been blessed with many instances where through physically connecting with stone and or concrete, especially within areas where trees and waters are abundant, I've been able to, to see the hum revealed through the natural too. And uh, it's, it really is a truly sublime and humbling experience, which has literally granted me pure connection. And like Brian Eno, um, it's during these moments that I, I do completely feel part of the machinery, so to speak. I do wonder if my synesthesia is the driving reason as to why I developed the sort of passions that I have. Um, the feeling of safety within these spaces, um, especially when wrapped within the concrete surroundings of an underpass or sat amid stones, trees, pylons. Now, I appreciate that this probably sounds very strange to many of you. I can't even explain it to myself. But for me, it brings comfort and connection. And hopefully, I'll be able to now give you some insight as to how these four strands interconnect um, to form the Liminal Worlds project. So, I have been somewhat obsessed with pylons since I was a young child, especially after my dad told me about how they helped to convey energy around the world. For a young, socially awkward girl living alone with her dad, this was a revelation. I began having vivid dreams where I would leave my physical body restlessly slumbering in its bed and connect through the pylons over yonder with the rest of the world. Um, I'd soar along the electric lays to faraway countries, Australia, the Soviet Union, um, this was after all the early 80s, uh, China, seeking out others like me who perhaps sought to be set free from their daily existences too. I was lucky enough to have a dad who indulged and encouraged my obsessions too. Um, those being with spectres, megaliths, folklore. He encouraged me to read Alfred Watkins' The Old Straight Track, which highlighted his documentation and mapping of ley lines. Watkins proposed that lays are straight lines, the tracks, invisible to the naked eye that convey esoteric energies. These lays, according to Watkins, were also perceived by prehistoric peoples, especially those who lived during the Neolithic period, which was in Britain, circa 4000 BCE to 2300 BCE and helped to inform the locating of ritual and communal megalithic monuments, such as Stonehenge and Avebury. Watkins also suggested that many significant medieval and early modern buildings were constructed upon ley lines as well to benefit from the power surging through them. Now, you may be asking yourself, what have invisible lines that may or may not stretch out across the landscape have to do with pylons and their connecting cables? Well, <clears throat> you may recall that earlier I referred to electric lays. There are people, myself included, who believe that the energy pulsing through pylons, cables and substations 
doesn't exist solely to bring light, warmth and technological comforts into your homes and workspaces. It is capable of so much more. We refer to this pulsating energy as the hum. When, as a child, I dreamt of being transported along those electric lays to connect with people in distant lands, I was perhaps unconsciously regressing back millennia to a time when communing with those who were distant, both physically and spiritually, was practiced regularly within Britain. Now, I can already anticipate the questions formulating, but there were no pylons in Britain thousands of years ago. So what are you trying to say? Well, I would argue that the hum is not a modern phenomenon. It has existed since time immemorial. In the 20th and 21st centuries, it is most closely associated with pylons. <clears throat> But if we step away from the electric lay for a short while, I shall endeavour to explain. Much archaeological research has been undertaken which focuses on animism, the belief that natural materials, landscapes, wood, water, stone, soil, etc., were animated and imbued with the spirits of ancestral forebears. Although this belief system is sadly not so prevalent in Britain today, it is still integral to many cultures around the world. Colin Richards um, has proposed that the stones used to create Neolithic circles may well have been chosen, not for the ease of their transportation, but because they contain specific energies that would inject power into both the monument and the people engaging with it. This power, I would suggest, is the hum, an energy which permeates the very fibre of the land, water and sky, which is in turn transferred on to all living things. The hum penetrates through to our very bones and connects life physically and metaphysically. It continues to pulse through the geological strata, waterways and forests, but now also has a modern counterpart within the electric lay. Although my obsession with the hum may seem somewhat strange, perhaps even unnerving to many, I believe that a greater connection with the natural and electric lays could offer positive possibilities for stimulating communal unity and solidarity. There are many different dialects within the hum, dialects that can often conflict with each other, um, yet connectivity is still maintained and energy is constant. The events of the past 12 months have left many people feeling isolated and afraid. Fearful not just of the biological pandemic, but of technology too. This is especially the case with 5G, vaccination treatments, the internet. However, this year has also highlighted how important technology is. It has enabled the world as a whole to stay connected, not only through the World Wide Web, but also television, radio and other forms of digital media. Connectivity is key, together although alone. The hum opens up ideas about connections between people, landscape and technology not just within our own individual vicinities, but regionally, nationally, internationally, perhaps even cosmically. For myself personally, my childhood dreams of traveling without moving 
connecting with people and lands throughout the world by ascending into the hum have finally been realized. Now, as I just mentioned, the hum for myself opens up connections between people, landscape and technology, but through the electric lay specifically, I believe that it can also initiate connection with people past, present, and those yet to manifest before us through virtual vistas. It enables us to reach out to spirits via digital Ouija boards, where we ourselves become the medium, the mouse morphing into a planchette. The digital world offers us access to the ephemeral, that which can only be seen by passing through certain thresholds in order to engage with different realms. It is these elements that I ponder within the realms of future ghosts. As the artist Mark Leckie states, I guess the modern ghost is a product of technology. On a psycholog psychological level, as soon as you get a moving image, its nearest analogy is a ghost or a phantom. Ghosts in the moving image have always been inextricably linked. Late February saw the emergence within the Twitterverse of the My Heritage Deep Nostalgia app. Tech that enables you to quote, animate your old family photos. By uploading an image, the app would bring the person to life. Within a few short moments, you could be visually engaging with a loved one, see them smiling, surveying their surroundings, looking right back at you, but not with the static stare of one frozen within a photographic image, but as one capable of seeing you, of reaching out to you. It first came to my attention one Saturday afternoon when suddenly Saint Therese of Lisieux appeared within my timeline, <clears throat> all smiles and serene gazes. She was closely followed by a number of other beatified beings, some ecclesiastical, others considered by some less devout, but no less divine to their devotees. From the moment I first laid eyes upon those images, something didn't feel right. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was a thought. Call it intuition, call it premonition, that I shouldn't be gazing upon those individuals. I felt voyeuristic, as if I was staring upon those who I had no rights to. It made me think of an article by my friend Simon Sellers, in which he discusses, amongst other things, how through accessing Google Earth, he was able to see his father in the back garden of his childhood home, a home that by the time of writing the article was no longer in the possession of the Sellers family. <clears throat> Open quote. Everything passes through us now electromagnetic waves, tweets bouncing from mobile phone towers through our bodies, images of our dead and dying loved ones. The machine teaches us how to remember, end quote. The machine teaches us how to remember. My father passed away suddenly, unexpectedly, on a hot summer's day in 1989. In some ways, it feels like it happened five minutes ago, jagged and raw. The memory of my 17 year old self performing CPR on my dad, desperately trying to bring back that which had already left. The repeated application of the resuscitation paddles, initiating false hopes. The electrical charges pulsing through my father's body prompting sounds akin to coughs, sighs. How many times did I believe that the paramedics had brought him back from the precipice? Too many, more than any person could endure. 
I have only two photographs of my dad. One as a young boy and one as a young man. I have none of him and me together. Friends have asked me why I haven't uploaded one of the two photos onto the My Heritage app. Personally, I'm conflicted. Part of me thinks that it's really great to see people such as MR James, Robert Louis Stevenson, and the multitude of others who have appeared in my Twitter timeline over the past few weeks. And yes, I have been sorely tempted to upload my dad. Yet, there's another part of me saying, this isn't right, that we're perhaps disturbing those who want to be left to rest. It almost feels like through this app, we're reanimating people for our own pleasure rather than at their behest. We Hooklanders know what can happen when we disturb the slumbering. Photos contain spirits. The digital world is full of ghosts. Uh, I don't want to vex any of them. I'm already haunted enough. Yet through technology, through the hum, for those who are brave enough, we now have the capability of stimulating the corporeal through the digital. Luigi Galvani's vision made manifest through remote access and still images, rather than through the physical application of electricity to decaying flesh. Yet, it's not only people who can be brought back to life within the realm of the digital. Landscapes, cities, countries, even whole worlds can be brought into being through the application of chroma key, more commonly referred to as green screen technology. Yet, these are landscapes that have either never physically existed, have ceased to exist within the physical world, or are misremembered mis by directors who want to present a certain artistic vision of a place when the reality doesn't appeal to their cinematic aesthetic. Spectral topographies inhabited by actors who themselves are ghosts in the making, who someday will cease to physically exist, but who will haunt us forever through these digital brigadoons that will only manifest when someone clicks on the access link through their server. Computer simulated landscapes becoming part of the digital stratigraphy that will be excavated through tech screens and advanced search engines, rather than sifting screens and trowels by archeologists to come. Sometimes when I watch TV, I stop being myself and I'm a star of the series. I have my own talk show, or I'm on the news getting out of a limo, going somewhere important. All I ever have to do is be famous. People watch me, they love me, and I will never, never grow old, and I will never die. And most of you probably know it, that's from John Carpenter's They Live. Alongside these spectral landscapes, the digital um, stratum of everyday lives continues to form at an exponential rate, hour by hour, day by day, year by year. Oh, I've just clicked a button. Oh, I've just finished this text and I'll sort that out. Um, year by year. Emails online, shopping, holiday destinations the music, film and television we engage with, the food and drink we ingest, our efforts to find romance, social media platforms, all are contributing to the burgeoning accumulations within these digital topographies. Even if or when these platforms go dark, cease to run in real time, those users their digital material culture, their lives, will live on through their collated and stored data far into the future. Although, although physically gone, 
they continue to inhabit these virtual vistas eternally, perhaps accessed primarily by archaeologists acting as mediums, manipulating those digital Ouija boards in order to connect with the spirits of those who lived in the 21st century and before. Now I'm just going to very quickly find my um, PowerPoint and start it again <laughs> and have a quick slurp on my drink. Bear with me one moment. Sorry. So as I was saying, perhaps in the future, people may continue to thrive instead to continue to walk within the, within the world, depositing physical material culture along the way even if global warming does continue apace. However, if the surface of the earth does become uninhabitable, and if not all of earth's population are, are lucky enough to begin a new life in the off-world colonies, they may well be compelled to head below ground, or at the very least to the semi-subterranean levels in order to survive. Spaces where even today, liminality permeates, especially within underpasses. As Peter Ackroyd says, the further downward you travel, the closer you come to the power. Underpasses are to be found within many towns and cities. They also appear within rural landscapes, often manifesting as tunnels and flyovers spaces of transportation by foot, pedal, automotive, other. Movement equals transition, not only within the physical, but also the metaphysical, the abstract enmeshed within the tangible. Underpasses bear witness to ritual activities and rites of passage, drinking, drug taking, communal gatherings, both large and small, acts of sexual congress. For many, the realm of the underpass is the zone in which they take their first faltering steps into adulthood, the inaugural intoxicated encounter, whether chemical and or alcoholic, the first erotic fumblings. For some, these rites are undertaken in order to forget, for others to remember. There are those who wish to disappear, both physically and transcendentally, to ascend to something beyond, initiate a euphoria, to achieve higher states of consciousness, of connection with themselves, with those who are, those who have been, those who have yet to come a clarion call to both inner and outer space. Open quote, dreams and speculations are woven around the vistas of underground realms. They are regions of limitless possibility. And that again is Peter Ackroyd. We approach underpasses with trepidation, whether instinctively or not, yet, we know that we must walk their path in order to reach the other side. Upon entering, I am physically removed from the world above, the world of natural light, the world of the living. I am underground, but I am not. I am moving through and within different spheres. By crossing the threshold of the underpass, am I heading into the underworld? Upon exiting and returning to the light, the land of the living, will I be the same person? Would I have undergone a rite of passage, however small? Once within these spaces, the everyday is challenged. The underpass is a place where new identities and agendas can be forged, where all acts are significant, but also where interactions with forces, <clears throat> both benevolent and malevolent, take place. Allure and dread interweave. The underpass can protect, enable one to dissipate, to flee from threat. 
Yet within these shadowy sanctuaries, monsters can often be found lurking within the tenebrosity. The underpass can be seen as a suspension of disbelief. It is a link between the routine every day and the more than human world. One must approach these spaces with caution. We accept that underpasses are an essential element for traversing the landscape, especially within cities and towns. But most people do not enjoy moving within them. The majority do not tend to stroll leisurely through an underpass. They are not the realm of the flaneur. Generally, they are navigated as quickly as possible. They are still replete with our fears and anxieties about venturing below the surface. Their modern concrete frames are incapable of subduing the powerful pulses that continue to emanate from these semi and fully subterranean interzones, spaces emitting signals that are still detectable if only subconsciously. The hum continuing to exert a potent hold on the imagination. Mark Leckie recalls how he had a sense of being propelled into the future while at the same time reversed into the prehistoric past, a past which held an animistic idea of the world in which rocks and trees could speak. Underground spaces are full of dark and invisible recesses. They harbour the potential for subversion. Places where illicit assignations can be negotiated and conducted. The pressure of the old earth lending more fervour to the scene. Within underpasses, it is dark and often poorly lit. A restricted space it can often feel claustrophobic, scary, unnerving. But can this also be considered slower, calmer, safer? Can the very invisibility of underground spaces, their disconnectedness from the world above, lend them an aura of impregnability and security? For millennia, people have sought refuge within the permeable, concealed places of the world, from the Paleolithic through to the Second World War and beyond, withdrawing to caves, underground stations, bunkers, underpasses, can be considered as something resembling the pre-birth state, the warmth and darkness radiating from the down below reigniting long buried remembrances of residing within the womb, deep stratigraphies stimulating deeper memories. The gateways to the underworld have been embellished with striking images. Aesthetics have been incorporated into sub-level architectural designs as a means of detracting people from the reality of stepping away from the surface, from safety and heading into the dark. Opulence, sinuous lines and voluptuous colours creating drama and grand spectacle, sparking wonder and excitement for what lies below. Even though our psyche tries to hold us back from these places of darkness and potential danger. Seductive aesthetics enchant, drawing individuals into the depths like moths to flames. Entrances to the underworld, underground stations in particular, are theater made manifest through steel, glass and neon light, enthralling those who pass by, beckoning them to pass through their portals. Architecture is modern Pied Piper, substituting penny whistle for chrome and illumination, luring the beguiled down into the underworld. Once drawn into the labyrinth, travellers continue to be mesmerised through visual art, commercial icons and posters. 
bold lines and colours jockey alongside corporate golden arches in a concerted effort to distract and tempt. Literary characters and historical events seek to showcase cities' deep histories to those who are travelling deep underground. Past, present and future congealed. <clears throat> The latent fear of what lies below bubbles beneath the surface of human facades. People are enticed to venture into the Stygian darkness, to follow the white rabbit who manifests as bright lights, seductive advertising, tantalizing aesthetics. Distractions to assuage the subliminal trepidations that silently gnaw upon people's apprehensions. Underpasses are integral. They ease physical travel, but are incapable of easing the mind. Upon entering these spaces, people understand, whether consciously or not, that they are penetrating a permeable place, that they are no longer fully in the land of the living, nor entirely within the realm of the dead, but somewhere other, an interzone, the path must be trod in order to reach the other side, no matter how physically or supernaturally perilous. Architecture is genuinely considered within contexts of facilitation, providing shelter, protection, enabling ease of movement, whether through automation, perambulation or the metaphysical. Societies also construct architectures of control, although most people would associate these structures within certain contexts, primarily prisons, youth detention centers. Architectures of control can also, I believe, be applied to, for example, psychiatric units, immigration detention centers. But what if we apply the concept of architectures of control to domestic and public contexts? And what if we were to apply these contexts to later prehistory, to look at the later British Neolithic through a modern lens? Welcome to Paranoid Architecture. In J.G. Ballard's 1975 novel, High Rise, the apartment block is seen as embodying social cohesion and the future. The story recounts life in a high rise brutalist edifice on the outskirts of London. Balfron Tower in East London is often indicated as the inspiration for Ballard's high rise. The tower block offers the occupants of its flats all the commodities and amenities of modern life. However, at some point the situation degenerates and grievances among neighbours and rival floors quickly escalate uncontrollably into fights throughout the building. The violence that erupts within the walls of the tower eventually takes the form of a civil war for the control of certain areas, such as the communal pool. According to Chris Hall, Ballard perhaps more than any other writer, focused on his character's physical surroundings and the effects that they had on their psyches. In recent years, there have been numerous reports of people who live in social housing units within luxury complexes, usually high rises, being restricted from using in-house amenities, such as gyms, pools, and outside leisure areas as well as having to use separate entrances. A number of papers have been written which focus upon a perceived notion of shared communality within the Neolithic period. Although archaeologists have looked at the possibility of physical segregation within monumental architecture and the possible societal issues that this may imply, Little focus has been placed on the potentially very real notion that the people of the Neolithic lived within a society in flux, a society where discord 
mistrust, friction and hostility permeated within all levels of domestic, communal and regional life. If, as it has often been stated, the late Neolithic was truly a halcyon existence for its inhabitants, both locally and on a border scale. Why would there even have been a need for physical segregation within these communally constructed monumental landscapes? Colin Richards has discussed the structural makeup of Scarborough Bray on mainland Orkney with regards to social distrust and segregation. He has argued that the interconnecting dwellings were not constructed from a purely egalitarian and socially co cohesive perspective, but were designed in order for inhabitants to keep a constant eye on their neighbours. The community would have been aware of what their neighbours were doing when they were doing it, when they were home or away, and who they were associating with. Scour Bray, I would suggest, could be considered an example of deviant and dystopic architecture, not a utopian ideal, but a physical manifestation of control. Perhaps a single story, horizontal, Neolithic, Ballardian high rise. I believe that we should consider the introduction of interconnected, close knit dwellings within the third millennium BCE, not as a measure of egalitarian comradeship, looking out for one's kith and kin, but rather as a means to observe one's neighbors. Everyone would have been aware of what their neighbors were doing within the confines of their homes and the settlement. When they left the community, whether they went alone or with others and for how long. And if this was the case, it's very probable that these people, both as individuals, families and communities, were aware that they too were under constant surveillance. Something that is all too apparent here in the 21st century. Living within the confines of settlements which, in reality, were nothing more than 24-hour viewing platforms, Neolithic panopticons used to intimidate and instill fear and paranoia. This control, both physical and social, although occurring some 5,000 years ago, is not so different to the separate entrances, restricted access to leisure and playground facilities and CCTV surveillance that tenants within modern settlement complexes have to endure. So you're probably asking yourselves, how does this tie in with liminality, with liminal worlds? Well, I would suggest that if we look back upon the actual origin of the word liminal, its derivation from the Latin limen, meaning threshold, then I believe that paranoid architecture is incredibly liminal within both physical and abstract contexts. Physically, because people, both past and present, are very much presented with thresholds that they either are or aren't permitted to pass through because of control by others that can manifest through perceived lack of social position, spiritual beliefs, etc. As mentioned previously, we see this in the 21st century. For example, through domestic luxury complexes, social housing tenants not being able to access their homes through the same public routes as others, notably private tenants and homeowners who reside within the same buildings, not being able to use public facilities within these complexes because of their social position, all inhabitants being under the constant scrutiny of their neighbours and building management security teams. Through architectural design, positioning of large windows, access points and CCTV and so forth. 
For those further up the social ladder, this may not appear to be an issue. However, factions, both social and political, constantly form. One may wake up on a Monday morning and all is well. Yet by Tuesday evening, they could have fallen to the position of persona non grata. It's all very well being a part of the all seeing eye until the gaze is turned upon you. From an abstract perspective, even a lack of physical barriers and walls does not mean that all are welcome and accepted. Again, within the context of luxury housing developments, people living within social housing units who have access to communal gardens and so forth may choose to avoid these areas completely in order to evade feelings of social discomfort. If, however, they do engage with these spaces, it is not uncommon to see people physically change the way in which they move within them, whether consciously or not. A change of gait, of pace, of route, remaining closer to the peripheries, etc. This behaviour is also common within other um, buildings, such as shopping malls, which include noticeably high-end designer shops. People who consider themselves as social trespassers within these elite zones often walk more quickly, rarely window shop, and tend to refrain from trying to enter these stores, which more often than not, have security staff who are somewhat similar to nightclub door staff in their policies on deciding who will be granted permission to enter and who will remain outside. Through these few examples, I see a social correlation between the shared experiences of people living within both the later Neolithic and 21st century Britain built around liminality. And as we have seen previously, liminal spaces can be, and often are, places of contention, spaces that people vie to control. So, we're now coming to the end of our wee mooch through the liminal worlds. Over the past, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour, oh crikey, or so, we've engaged with the hum, digital ghosts, underpasses, and paranoid architecture. To some, perhaps all of you, these four threads may still seem completely disparate, and that's okay. Um, but I would suggest there is a key element flowing throughout the four projects and thus liminal worlds as a whole, and that's energy. Energy pulses through not just the dialects of the HUM project, but also future ghosts underpasses of liminal places and paranoid architecture, emanating as the hum through soil, stone, wood, water, pylon, powering our connection with landscape, place, people, past, present and future within both the physical and digital worlds. Often the connections are beautiful benevolent, but as we often find when we wander through the liminal, malevolence is also present. Energy often presents as a negative, not just as a positive. Liminal places are often spaces of contention where people vie for control. And this too can be ascertained through all four of the projects, but within paranoid architecture especially, where the very real possibility of manipulation and control being inherent within society for at least 5,000 years is explored. I hope that you found this presentation of some interest. As I, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the Liminal Worlds website will be going live within the next week or so, where you'll be able to explore each element more fully and keep up to date with new research and articles that will be added from here on in. And I'm more than happy to take questions, which I will try to answer to the best of my ability. So um, 
on closing, I would just like to say thank you very much for coming along and listening. Thank you to Sarah Jane for asking me to speak tonight. And I'm now going to be quiet and, and have a very um, hearty sniff there. So thank you very much. <laughs> you are very welcome, Becky. That was absolutely amazing. Go get yourself a drink. Oh, Why about we all give back a little bit of a clap? That was amazing. And then we all go get a drink and come back here in about 10 minutes. No worries. I'm just trying to. Good. Oh, there, there's a button. Sorry. <laughs> 10 minutes good for, for a break, a drink. Oh, and we'll be here for some I questions. I don't know how to do that. I've been trying to do that for like six months. Marvellous. So I put my picture up. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Winning. <laughs>